my dear friends. Welcome to Darktown. Population unknown, but decreasing with every passing story. Darktown is your typical American Midwest urban metropolis, but one with more than its fair share of mystery and intrigue. Tonight we have four tales from Darktown not necessarily taking place at the same time, but all occurring within the area we know as Dark Town. So sit back and relax with your favorite drinks, my friends. We're going on a journey. Stay with me, and I'll keep you safe. In our first story in tonight's collection, a young woman finishes a long, hard day at work. In her state of exhaustion, she struggles to remember where she'd parked her car that morning. Surely that can't be too big a sign of trouble ahead, can it? Well, this is Dark Town, so we shall just have to wait and see. I work in an insurance company. I was in the midst of finishing my attempt to perm assignment, and working major overtime. My boss, of course, didn't mind, as we had a lot of projects to complete, and she needed someone willing to stay and work the late hours. I didn't mind because, well, let's face it, college loans were killing me, and I needed the extra money. My co-worker, John, was also a temp to perm stayed late with me to help finish the massive project which was due that day. After coming in early, working through lunch, and leaving at 9pm, we had finally completed the project. As we left, John noted that the hallways were eerily dark, even for it being 9pm on a Friday night. I brushed it off with a joke that there were probably ghosts and, or, demons running amok, this was their way of telling us we had to leave. When we finally made it down to the parking lot, I panicked for a moment, as I couldn't see my car. But as I passed a tree, I realized my tiny Fiat was simply hidden behind the massive trunk of the tree. As I walked closer to my car, I noticed that it was facing the wrong way, and stopped walking. John, who wasn't paying attention, looked back at where I was standing and asked what was wrong. I... maybe it's just been a long day, but I swear I didn't back my car into that spot, I said tiredly, shaking my head, and continued walking. You just finished a 13-hour shift with no lunch. You're exhausted and your blood sugar is low. You probably forgot that you parked that way this morning. John said, trying to ease my worry. I sighed. Yeah, you're right. All right, well, see you bright and early Monday morning. We waved goodbye as he climbed into his car and drove off. I stood at the front of my car and, cocking my head to the side, I stared at it, racking my brain trying to remember how I'd parked it this morning. I rubbed my eyes and, in defeat, I sighed once more, shook my head at my silliness, and climbed into my car. It was too warm for an April night, so I rolled the windows down and contemplated putting the top down as well. In hindsight, I wonder if that might have changed anything. If maybe this whole thing never would have happened. Instead, I turned up my music and drove home. As I was driving home, I called my mother to let her know that I was finally leaving work. She was at the beach house with friends, but it was still good to hear her voice. Hi, Mum. I'm finally leaving work, I said as I rolled up the windows and turned on the AC. Hi, sweetie. Long day for you. She said, over the background noise of what sounded like a few of her neighbours gathered around the bonfire. Yeah, came in early, worked through lunch, and I'm... 
I paused as I heard a jingling noise. It almost sounded like someone clinking two quarters together or shaking a dog's metal prong collar. Are you okay? My mother's voice came through the speakers of my car's Bluetooth. Oh, yeah, no, I'm fine. It's fine. Sorry, I'm just really tired, I told her, silently chiding myself for listening to too many horror podcasts at work. Mum went on to tell me about the dogs and how everyone was just going down to the beach house. As she was talking, that same clinking, that same jangling continued every now and again. Mom, do you hear that? Hear what? That jangling or clinking or whatever it is. A duchess's tags clinking together. I don't hear anything. And Duchess is outside with your father. <sighs> okay. It's probably an old spoon down on my floor. <laughs> or I'm about to be murdered. <laughs> Whatever. If I am murdered, at least I won't have to pay off my student loans. <laughs> Mom didn't find that last comment particularly funny. <sighs> your fear is too tiny to fit a murderer. Just remember that, honey. Anyways, I have to go. Have a good weekend. I love you. I bade her goodbye and told her to tell Dad I'd said hi. As I pulled up to a red light and clicked the button to end the call, I glanced at my back seat. I'd put one of the seats down earlier in the week, and I could almost see into the truck. <laughs> a murderer could so fit into my car, I said to myself as the light turned green. I kept the music off, but rolled the windows down again. As I accelerated, I heard the jingling again. I groaned in annoyance and twisted in my seat to see if there was anything back there. Nothing. It was empty. Gah, what the hell? I said angrily. Another stoplight and the jangling began again. Oh, for the love of God, I said, frustrated. Hi, if you're gonna kill me, just do it already. Nothing. I sighed in frustration and continued driving. This time I turned on the music, nice and loud. As I pulled into my driveway, I turned the music down and rolled up the windows. I was humming the rest of my favorite song and gathering my phone and purse, when a hot, searing pain erupted in my ribs. I gasped and couldn't suck in any air to my lungs. My hands went to the source of the pain and I felt a knife sticking out of my ribs. I couldn't bring myself to turn my head but I felt someone's breath tickle my ear. Fear overtook my senses and I sat there frozen until I forced myself to look into the visor mirror. As I looked into my back seat, my eyes met a pair of blue eyes. A man crouched behind my seat, smiling, and emitted a breathy laugh. I guess a murderer really can fit in your car. He breathed into my ear. For our second story this evening, we remain in the heart of Darktown, but moving on to the hospital. A young medical worker comes face to face with an unusual patient and takes matters into her own hands. Let's see how it ends. It's called the Hippocratic Oath. I pledged myself to uphold this when I became a doctor. Do no harm is about as brief a summary that can be created for this agreement. No matter who the patient, what they've said, done or believe in, 
I can never turn them away. It seems like an obvious decision to always help a person in need. But we all get tested at some point. For me, it was my son's murderer. Four years ago, he rounded a corner in his truck by my son's elementary school without paying as much attention as he should have. My son was killed on impact. The image of his mangled body on the road forever burned into my mind. The sickening crunch and assorted screams along with it. The killer walked. According to the judge, my son was not fully within a crosswalk as he crossed the street towards me meaning the man was not liable. Absolution from the court must not have been enough to clear his own guilt, however, as the face that lay in front of me, that I will never forget, was identified under a different name. In the three months since he arrived under my care, he has not had a single visitor. Either he cut ties with everyone he knew, or they cut ties with him. Maybe both, and I don't blame any of them for it. He arrived comatose from a cocktail of sleeping pills, pain medications, and some chemicals yet to be identified. For three months, he has remained this way. But not for a lack of trying to pass on. As much as I want to end his life every day when I see his static face, to stab his eyes through with scalpels, to cut him open and remove everything but his black heart. I don't. I care for him like I would any other patient, because I am a professional and I honour my oath. Every day I check on him first when I arrive and last before I leave. I keep him alive because that's my job. He has yet to become brain dead, so I hope he has some idea of what's going on. That I am keeping him breathing. Albeit through tubes, because I fulfill my responsibilities. Something he never seemed to understand. I hope he's at least somewhat conscious beneath his dead expression. That time is passing normally for him so he can reflect on his mistake and realize how much worse he is in comparison to the rest of the civilized world. But, at the end of the day, there's nothing more I can do. I won't end his life, but I can't bring him back to the world either. All I can do is let him lay there, like furniture, and keep him from falling apart. But I suppose I'm lucky in a way. I was lucky to be the first on call to care for him. Lucky that he has no visitors. And lucky that no one at work recognizes the John Doe I put in his room. As night closes in, I make sure his IV is full enough to keep him resting easy through the night. I turn off the basement lights and take one last look at the chart I brought home from the hospital to read that one section that lets me rest easy as well. Do not resuscitate. Revenge, it seems, in Darktown at least, is a dish best served long and slow. Now, for our next story, we move away from the city centre and out into the suburbs. A young man has stayed out too late at night and tries to sneak into the house unobserved. Let's see if he makes it. I walked into the house through the big front door careful to shut it quietly so as not to wake anyone upstairs. Ooh, I'd been out later than I'd expected. 
so I tiptoed cautiously up the stairs, imagining myself as a mouse, quietly putting one foot in front of the next. I knew that if I woke anyone up, I'd be in big trouble. I skulked down the long upstairs hallway I'd walked through so many times before. Considering how late it was, there were no lights on in my hallway, but I didn't need to see to know where the walls were. I reached out my hand in the darkness and took hold of the cool silver door handle and soundlessly entered the bedroom. Just as I'd gone into the room, I heard a noise coming from downstairs. A million and one thoughts rushed through my mind as I quickly ducked underneath the bed. Everyone in the house was asleep, or at least they should have been. It was extremely early in the morning, and no one knew I'd gone. No one should be up, and that's what scared me. It couldn't have been something falling from one of the cupboards, could it? No, I decided. Definitely not. There was someone else in my house. I crawled slowly underneath the bed all the way into the middle as to avoid being seen. And then, I waited. A few minutes later I heard the footsteps coming up the stairs. One by one, they thudded their way slowly, menacingly, to the top. Though they weren't anywhere near me, yet. I was all the way at the end of the hall, hidden underneath this bed. I glanced to the right, and stared up at the glowing red numbers, indicating the time on the alarm clock. They read 1.52am. I hadn't realised how late I'd stayed out. The rhythmic thumps of the footsteps cautiously making their way up the wooden staircase would have lulled me to sleep if I hadn't been so on edge, nervously wondering who it could be. I heard a door creak open on the other side of the hallway. There were three more doors before this one though, so I prayed that whoever it was would think I wasn't there and leave before they reached the door which concealed my existence for the time being. I looked towards the brown door which guarded the room I was hiding in. I prayed for it to stay shut. I prayed that I would remain hidden. I don't care much for tight spaces, so as my breathing became shallower and laboured, I became increasingly more nervous. Thoughts like, what if they hear me? And then, calm down, they don't know you're in here yet, floated across my mind. They can't know I'm here, I thought. I was upstairs and they were downstairs. They have no way of knowing this is where I am. I heard the creaking in the hallway as the next door opened, and I heard rustling coming from inside the room. Whoever it was, was searching for something. For me, presumably. No, not for me. Whoever it is doesn't know that you're here. Calm down, John. Calm down. Although, apparently no one was in that room. Because before I knew it, the footsteps emerged back out and into the hallway. And the next door was being opened. The slow and nerve-wracking footsteps echoed in my mind. That was when I knew they weren't going to stop looking. I fumbled in my pockets, as quietly as I could, for something I could use. My fingers brushed against cold plastic. <sighs> my phone! But then my stomach dropped and my heart sank. <laughs> of course. I couldn't call the police. As my attention slowly turned towards the brown door again, I heard the footsteps approach the door. I watched the light stream in 
as the entrance to the room inched open, and two small feet ambled their way in. I inched further back, away from them, as a natural instinct, when I was still surprised. This wasn't who I had pictured. These feet belonged to a little boy. The little feet stumbled to the top of the bed. I could feel the little boy shaking the two figures above me, shaking them into consciousness. I slowly slid my knife out of my jacket's front pocket, readying myself, trying to avoid the light which was now streaming in through the open door and catching the blade. I was surprised. He'd made it back quicker than I'd expected, but now was my only chance. <sighs> I'm so sick of people thinking this house belongs to them. The little boy began to speak as I slowly emerged. Mommy, Daddy, the little voice belonging to the feet whispered. I think there's someone in our house. Well, some people just seem to have a real problem of letting go of the past, don't they? Ah. Others can't help but look forward to the future. And that moves us on to our final story this evening. Jenna, a young girl, is days away from celebrating her birthday. So, what surprises do her family have in store for her? And what does she have for them? The tall grandfather clock bellowed four times through the two-story house as the county school bus pulled off from the driveway. A young girl named Jenna McClure sat on the carpeted floor of the second level, playing in solitude with each of her stuffed toys outside of her bedroom. Jenna was a joyful and quiet child that belonged to a broken family. Her thick, curly locks were of the darkest brown, reaching just below her waist in length. The girl's wavy bangs just barely grazed over her long, brown lashes, casting a shade over her large, almond-coloured orbs. Her tanned skin resembled that of a silky fabric, and she was of a fairly average size for an eight-year-old female. The rest of the world seemed non-existent as she played and laughed, but she secretly longed for someone else to play with. No other child at school or in the neighborhood would even consider playing with Jenna, due to her past. As Jenna and her friends would play with their dolls and stuffed animals, Jenna was persistent on playing Haunted House or Murder Mystery. Whenever she decided to have her friends over for slumber parties, she would tell ghost stories as night fell and scare the other girls to the point of tears. These things frightened the other kids and caused them to avoid her in every way possible. But that didn't shake Jenna too much, because she was used to being alone, and it wasn't like her older sister Gabby would play with her. No, don't shoot, Jenna cried dramatically, pretending to fire a gun at one of the toys. As if on cue, the stuffed cat fell over on its side, causing Jenna to break into a fit of giggles. Not so loud, Jenna, her grandmother called from downstairs, and the little girl sighed at the end of her laughter. Sorry, Nana. Jenna loved her Nana dearly, but she was a very strict woman, who didn't think little girls her age should play with toys. Even so, her grandmother always took the liberty of caring for the two girls while their mother was away. Jenna dwelled within a standard house in the suburb, along with her sister, dog, grandmother, mother, and her mother's fiancé even came to visit every now and again. Although she never saw her mother very often, as she only came around to visit every once in a while, which was typically when she wasn't drinking at her fiancé's house. The only reason her mother had gotten engaged for the fourth time was because she wanted financial support. Paul, 
her mother's fiancé, was a very wealthy man, who happened to own a multi-million dollar company. Paul was a kind and generous man that treated Jenna and Gabby like they were his own, but possessed an extremely wide history of medical problems. The familiar resonance of the front door opening and shutting made the walls rattle, and thumping footsteps soon followed. The footfall ceased when they reached the spot in which Jenna sat. Jenna's eyes trailed upward to her fourteen-year-old sister's blank expression. A single backpack strap hung from Gabby's right shoulder, her hazel eyes matching the dullness of her appearance. Jenna stared into the eye that wasn't curtained by her ebony hair, then flashed a toothy grin out of a pure knee-jerk reaction. Gabby's monotone look melted into a scowl making Jenna frown and slink back from her sibling. Satisfied with the reaction she got, Gabby turned and continued on her way to the bedroom they shared. Jenna couldn't help but feel as though she had done something wrong to her sister. But Gabby had no logical reason behind being so cross with Jenna, except that they each held a separate biological father. Because of this fact... Gabby wouldn't think of Jenna as a real sister, so she certainly wasn't going to treat her like one. Things were seldom in Jenna's favour, but she held on desperately to the remaining happiness she had left, like her soon-to-be stepfather. Jenna's ninth birthday was in two days, and she couldn't wait to celebrate it with a party. No persuasion could be made with any of her friends to attend the gathering but she made the entire household promise to come, so Jenna was content. All she desired was to share her special day with family and toys. Minutes turned to hours of fiddling with dolls, and Jenna still hadn't heard from or seen her mother all day. The warm Friday sunset eventually faded over the horizon, jilting the land to be lit with only a bright, full moon. The time for sleep drew near, and a tired yawn escaped Jenna's mouth as she tiptoed into her bedroom. The room was dimmed with a colourful nightlight, casting thin shadows onto her sister's sleeping form not far away. Taking extra precaution not to awaken Gabby or her grandmother across the hall, she soundlessly slid over to her white dresser and pulled forth some pyjamas. Once she slipped into a violet nightgown, she crawled into bed and curled up to her tattered, stuffed fox. Gabby's bed and Jenna's bed were parallel to one another, with a white nightstand separating them. Jenna had a large plethora of toys that occupied her bed, but her fox was the overall favourite. Jenna's mother had given her the little fox as a gift for her sixth birthday, and Jenna hadn't parted with it since. It didn't take too much for Jenna to nod off, snoring lightly as crickets sang from outside their bedroom window. The girl tossed and turned in various arrangements during the night, seeking to expel the strange nightmares. Jenna typically had odd dreams, but this occasion was exceptionally brutal and realistic. Vivid images of her mangled and mutilated family members attacked her subconscious. But what bewildered Jenna the most was her mother's fiancé, because he didn't seem to be harmed in any way, but merely sprawled out on the ground, twitching and gasping for reasons unknown. Otherwise, the concept of death had never particularly disturbed her, and it had always come across as interesting. The next morning, Jenna woke with a start her lurching into a sitting position on the mattress at the sound of a feminine shriek resonating throughout the house. Her erratic breathing came to a halt when she noticed the absence of her elder sister in the room, and only a lumpy comforter resided where Gabby once was. Throwing her blankets to the side, Jenna hesitantly emerged from the bedroom and into the hall. Gabby, are you there? She piped up the words somewhat slurred by her loose tooth. 
Her small feet patted against the springy carpeting to delve further into the morning's events, finally coming to a standstill when she arrived atop of the stairs. She could perceive a commotion of some sort arising from the dining area downstairs, but deafening sirens that screeched in the distance ultimately convinced her to scramble down the staircase. Jenna quickly peered over the stair rail into the kitchen her eyes immediately beholding the scene before her. The man that was meant to be her new father was extended along the tile floor, twitching and gasping uncontrollably. Jenna's mother was pacing from one end of the kitchen to the other, compressing her inky hair into her slim fingers. All the while, Gabby was kneeling on the ground, her hands holding Paul's head in a gentle manner. Jenna couldn't seal the tears that flowed from her eyes and cascaded down her puffy red cheeks at the sight. The sirens gave an indication of being closer than before, flashing red lights flooding through the windows at an identical pace. Jenna's grandmother immediately bolted toward the front door from another room and hastily yanked it open, allowing doctors and medical assistants to speed into the house critical determination etched onto each face. Jenna took note of how Paul had ended all movement by now, his face taking on a greyish hue during the time they lifted his body onto a tall gurney. A young brunette woman that wore black medical scrubs approached Paul's body and removed the stethoscope from around her neck, placing the round end on his chest to inspect his heartbeat. Strangely, things seemed to settle down quite a bit. After much discussion between the grown-ups, Jenna observed in confusion as they drew a white sheet over his head, probably so he wouldn't get cold. None of the doctors or nurses acknowledged Jenna's presence while speaking to her mother in hushed tones, but it didn't take long for all to file back out and head off from the house toting away the only dad she had left. Jenna's mother trailed after them hurriedly, not bothering to give her daughters so much as a passing glance before slamming the door on her way out. The sirens of the ambulance did not recur. Jenna furrowed her thin brows and set a fearful gaze on her nana who ordered the two sisters to play upstairs until told otherwise. They reluctantly abided their nana's orders and trudged up the carpeted stairs, unable to fully grasp the situation. The atmosphere felt tense and awkward to Jenna, her little digits fidgeting nervously as Gabby remained silent. Gabby sauntered her way into her room, feeling the uncomfortable eye set on her while plopping herself down on the bed. Jenna followed close by, standing inaudibly beside her sister. What happened to Mr. Paul? Mummy and Paul are coming back, right? Jenna inquired sheepishly, her voice faltering some at the end. Gabby arose from her position on the mattress towering over the little girl as an unnecessary bile simmered within and overthrew her emotions. Don't you get it? Mum doesn't care what happens to Paul, just as long as she gets ownership of his company, she hissed, striding toward Jenna in an attempt to seem intimidating. It's all fun and games to you, isn't it? Paul isn't coming back. I doubt he ever cared about you anyway. Any guy who has money can take advantage of Mom. Besides, I don't think he would bother wasting his time on an ignorant, naive little brat like you. Your mom will never be a mother to me, so don't you think for a second that I will ever call you a sister. And with that statement, Gabby jerked her hands forward and rammed her palms into Jenna's shoulders, knocking the girl clean off her feet. Her arms flew from her sides to catch and hoist her weight on instinct, but the action was proven futile. Jenna's head made harsh contact with the bottom corner of her white bed frame, producing a sharp cry from her. 
Jenna was well aware that Gabby tended to unleash her anger on others, but she had never attacked anyone physically like that. Jenna could only lie on the floor, stupefied by her sister's endeavor to harm her. Gabby, however, wasn't phased in the slightest, and stomped out of the room without another word exchanged. Jenna was speechless when more tears proceeded to fall now accompanied by ones that resembled pain. Small droplets of crimson blossomed where the wood of the frame had lanced Jenna's skull, so the girl shakily stood from the ground to retrieve a paper towel, bitterly muttering, I never want another dad, ever again. The day dragged on, with no sign of Jenna's mother or stepfather for hours. Jenna and Gabby were served a few snacks here and there, but breakfast and lunch were disregarded. Once again, the grandfather clock chimed in the house, this instance signaling that of eight o'clock. Jenna felt obligated to steer clear of Gabby, and entertained herself by petting and pampering her toy fox. She couldn't bring herself to rat Gabby out for the act she had committed. Gabby genuinely unnerved Jenna, and Jenna wished greatly for Gabby to like her, so she kept her mouth shut. It was just a little push, as far as Jenna wanted to think. Jenna's head snapped up at the creak of the front door opening, and she was up and rushing down the stairs in an instant. She stood eagerly on the bottom step, poking her head around the end of the railing to view her mother and Nana. They both sat at the kitchen table, chatting emotionally over a glass of wine. Jenna made up her mind to leave them be, and perched herself quietly on the final step. Her head hung low. She only overheard a conversation about financial problems and funeral prices in their discussion, but she eventually caught on to the situation. More tears began to swell in her glossy orbs, to which she quickly wiped away. There was nothing more Jenna yearned to hear, so she sluggishly returned to her room, struggling to keep her bloodshot eyes open along the way. Gabby was already dozing off, as per usual, leaving Jenna to perform her nightly routine in silence. She was pushing herself to the limit in an urge to stay positive. After all, she had a birthday the following day, and she had once promised Paul that she would always keep smiling, no matter the circumstances. So, Jenna did whatever it took to make herself smile again, remembering fondly the sparkly and multicolored party decorations she had for her birthday. And even if Paul wasn't there, the rest of her family had given their word, and Jenna's faith remained with her family on that. Unfortunately, the nightmares tumbled through Jenna's head in her slumber yet again, mirroring those of the night previous. But this time, they didn't trouble Jenna in any form or fashion. The dream seemed strangely comforting, and it was almost as if she didn't have to be alone anymore, omitting that she actually was alone. Something didn't quite feel right, but it made her smile. The next morning, Jenna didn't hesitate to jump straight out of bed, already smiling in anticipation. She took one quick glance over at where her sister would have been, doing a double take. Gabby wasn't where she'd left her, but another vacant bed was left over. Shrugging her shoulders, Jenna skipped to her dress and ripped open the bottom drawer. After sifting through the contents of the compartment for a while, she pulled out a purple dress for her party. The dress had thin straps at the top, the bottom flowing down to her knees, and a few rows of purple ruffles were aligned vertically on the bottom half. The words, Happy Birthday, were stitched across the chest in big white letters with a few loose strings fluttering as she moved about. Then, 
She slid on a pair of flat, charcoal dress shoes, each shoe wearing a little black bow at the tip. Lastly, Jenna brushed the tangles out of her long hair and raced clumsily down the stairs, where she presumed everyone would be waiting. To Jenna's surprise, she was accompanied only by an empty living room. Darting her eyes around in puzzlement, she wandered into the kitchen, supposing her family must be waiting in another room. Again, she found a lifeless area of the house. Jenna began to panic and investigated the space for any sign of their location. While she searched, the girl came across a small note that was taped to the fridge and curiously plucked it from its place. Jenna read the note aloud. Girls, your mother and I have gone out to eat with one of your mother's employees, Mike. Be back soon. Sincerely, Nana. She had difficulty pronouncing a word or two, but understood what it meant. Although, the note didn't share anything that concerned Gabby's whereabouts. Gabby! Jenna bawled placing the note on the kitchen counter. Gabby, are you here? She asked again, raising her volume. But her inquiry fell on deaf ears as no response came. Jenna's eyes fell to the floor. Maybe she's at her friend's house. She'll probably be back soon. She assured herself, tugging on the refrigerator door. There was a vanilla birthday cake from the icebox that Jenna set neatly in its respective place on the table, removing the lid to put nine candlesticks into the saccharine food item. Paul had allowed Jenna the choice of her own cake at the grocery store earlier in the week, along with the purchase of a small present that she wasn't admitted to open until after they'd eaten the cake. She gathered up her favourite toys at the table, hung her birthday banner across the dining room wall, set purple flowers along the counters and walls, and a little glitter never hurt anyone. Jenna managed to finish up within half an hour, right about nine o'clock in the morning. With a glimmering purple cone hat strapped to her head, she sat herself down at the kitchen table. Jenna didn't even want to leave the table until her family got back, so she kicked her heels and patiently awaited their return. Six times the grandfather clock rang, informing inhabitants that the sun would begin to fall in the sky. But Jenna had not moved from her spot at the kitchen table. No one came home in those nine hours, or even took into account the girl's birthday. She was deathly quiet, inhumanly motionless, barely blinking her sunken eyes that continuously stared at the white wall in front of her. The clock's ticking pendulum was the only noise made throughout the subdued house, almost mocking her loneliness. Jenna knew she needed to smile, but she felt numb, like something inside of her had broken. Her eyes flickered down to the chalky paring knife that rested innocently next to a bowl of fruit her fingers soon crawling forward and grasping it tightly. She then carried out her nearly disregarded promise and smiled from ear to ear. During the next few hours, Gabby came marching up the back porch from her friend's house, jamming her key into the lock on the back door. Hey, Max, she greeted her dog, petting the fur on his head. However, Max only snapped and snarled at the door in return, instead of jumping and barking happily as he normally did. Gabby rolled her eyes, wrenching the heavy door open and closing it after her. C crazy dog, she mumbled, and threw her bag down on the floor. Right away, she noticed how eerily silent the house was, but didn't think much of it. Mom? Nana? Gabby hollered out, recalling her mother's car that was parked in the driveway. Of course, 
She knew her sister had to be somewhere nearby. Jenna! Plodding over to the stairs, she scanned the different rooms that she passed, ultimately finding no one. Jenna! Her voice was lowered as she stepped cautiously up the staircase, skimming her hand over the beige wall. While taking wary strides toward her room, a flimsy object of some sort crunched under Gabby's foot. Cocking a thick brow, the teenager bent down and lifted a purple party hat from the ground. As she was examining the specks of red that dotted the paper headwear, a small but audible thump originated from behind her wooden bedroom door. Gabby shot a menacing glare at the door, tossing the hat into the other direction. Jenna, I know you're in there. She flung the door open in annoyance, a fragment of hallway light spilling into the unlit room. An awful metallic scent permeated her nostrils when she entered, but she simply dismissed the fact. Gabby fingered the wall on her left to flick the light switch, discovering that someone had stuck countless layers of tape over the switch to keep it off. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, she grumbled, stepping off to the side and peeling the tape from the plastic. Suddenly, the bedroom door slammed shut causing Gabby to nearly leap out of her skin. She could just faintly hear a heavy breathing in front of her, prompting her to take several steps backward. Gabby's heart began hammering in her chest, her nerves dancing frantically to the beat. Jenna? Come on, this isn't funny. She received no reply from the darkness that surrounded her. In a rather abrupt manner, the switch to the lights was clicked on without any further warning, triggering Gabby to squint her eyes in the haze of brightness. Once they adjusted to the lighting, Gabby's eyes widened to the size of her bald fists. Jenna was poised a short distance away, a wide, malevolent grin plastered onto her smooth face one that seemed luminescent compared to the rest of her dark aspects. Her chocolate mane was matted, scratches covered her limbs, and flakes of dried blood clung to the skin on her cheeks. A fresh, crimson substance coated the majority of her legs and dress, while she clenched a stained, glistening kitchen utensil in her right hand. Her other arm cradled a bloodied, stuffed fox, who lacked a single button eye, with white stuffing protruding from the rips in its fabric. Jenna's shoes left scarlet footprints in the tan carpet, as she stalked toward her sister. Realization slowly dawned on Gabby, and it took every fiber of her being not to scream when she laid eyes on the room around her. Smeared handprints of red lined the walls. Lamps were knocked over, and assorted items were strewn across the floor to insist the obvious signs of a struggle. The intense odor shot uncomfortably icy chills down Gabby's backside, adding to the below ambient temperature that this specific room held. Jenna, look, I don't know what the hell is going on here, but you better tell me where Mom and Nana are right now, Gabby demanded, beginning to back away from the shorter girl. Jenna's smile seemed to increase, and she paused a few feet in front of Gabby. What's the matter, sissy? You aren't smiling, Jenna cooed, taking another step. Do you know what happens to people who don't smile? Gabby's face paled significantly, the adrenaline in her system causing her arms to coil in defense, as she set aside her dignity and implored. No, please, get away. Come on, Jenna, we're sisters. This is crazy. 
Jenna chuckled through her gritted teeth, a wry smile sculpting her lips. Oh, is that so? No, I don't think it is. Your mom will never be a mother to me, so don't you think for a second that I will ever call you a sister? She taunted her older sibling, using the reminiscent command in a sing-song tone. Gabby's feet appeared like they were glued to the floor, a look of unadulterated horror sweeping over her refined features as Jenna continued. You know, you were right, Gabby. It's all just fun and games. Jenna was small when compared to her sister, but she was nimble and accommodated plenty of energy. Gabby's screams emanated throughout the house for the duration of the night haunting echoes sounding as though she were pleading for hours, even if she was lifeless within minutes. The magenta candles on Jenna's birthday cake were the only source of light in the house, with each of Jenna's immobile family members and blood-soaked toys gathered around it. Everyone wore radiant party hats, thanks to Jenna, and were thoroughly dressed in red. They all sat at the table in a near-pitch-black kitchen, but Jenna was the only one capable of singing her birthday song. When the time came, she couldn't have undone the bow on Paul's birthday gift quick enough, revealing a sparkly set of ruby earrings, which she swiftly drove through her unpierced earlobes in the excitement of owning her first pair. The pain and the god-awful scent didn't trouble Jenna in the slightest. Given that she was finally alongside her family, and her sizable grin suggested that she was the happiest she had ever been. Now, my dear friends, I hope you've enjoyed our first excursions into Dark Town. This seems like a nice way of bringing several stories together into one universe in which they could all exist. If you don't agree, please tell me in the comments. If you like it, I'll stick to this format in the future. Now, you have a lovely weekend, everyone. I'll be back again with more stories for you on Monday. But for now, bye-bye.